All right, thank you for coming to this week's SETI talk. Um, our speaker today is Chris Kempis. I uh, received his PhD from MIT and then did postdoctoral work uh, here at the SETI Institute, uh, and that was jointly with Caltech and NASA Ames. And he is now an Omidyar postdoctoral fellow at the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, Chris's work uh, focuses on creating mathematical and physical models to understand biology, uh, in particular ecology and evolution. His talk today is entitled Power Laws, Predictable Evolution, and the Limits of Life. Let's welcome Chris. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, and thanks for having me here today. Today, um, I want you to think a little bit differently about um, evolution, um, often in the way that I think about evolution. Um, so typically, the way that uh, biologists have thought about the history of life on the planet is to really focus on the vast amounts of biological diversity that we see in the world. Um, and in fact, this is, this is the fundamental and right way to think about biology because it's where so much of the beauty lies, is in thinking about why it is we see such a diversity of morphological forms in the world um, and different types of physiology and different types of organisms living in vastly different environments. Um, however, a lot of what I think about is how can we look at this vast diversity and find ways to generalize um, commonalities or search for commonalities that links together all these different organisms. And the reason that we would hope that some of those commonalities actually exist is because each of these organisms is sitting in some physical environment and over the long course of evolution has had time to deal with the dominant physics of different environments or different situations. And so the hope then is that by focusing on the physics, we might be able to say something um, about commonalities across the rather impressive um, diversity of life that we actually see. So to make that a little bit more explicit, um, today um, I want to focus on two questions which are common questions for me um, in the work that I do. And the first is by looking at trends across many species, across vast diversity, what fundamental commonalities can we find in life? What physical mechanisms can we uncover? And what can we infer about uh, what's actually organized in evolution and ecology at the largest scales of time, space, um, and diversity. And then the second question is, if we're successful in doing this and finding some common set of mechanisms and understanding cross-species trends, what does that actually do for us? How can we take these and use them to say something about hard limits for life or ecological response um, or even the possibility of life persisting um, or becoming extinct given a set of environmental conditions and fluctuations. So for cross-species trends, is there any hope in actually finding these? Um, and I want to begin um, with this slide, um, which isn't from my own work, but I think is a really nice illustration of what I mean by a general trend. And so what this plot is showing is the logarithmic mass of an organism, of a single whole organism, plotted against the um, logarithmic, logarithmic biomass production rate. And I've removed the units from this because it's uh, the, the units in this paper are actually fairly confusing um, and it would take a long time to explain, but the important point is just to think about how many orders of magnitude um, we're going across in terms of mass and biomass production. Because this plot shows that on average, spanning about 30 or 40 orders of magnitude in body size, we see an amazing diversity of life from single cell plants up to multicellular plants, multicellular mammals, flying mammals, birds, um, and insects, we see that they all fall along um, with pretty good approximation one curve. And this curve is a power law. On a log log plot, we have a line. And as a physicist, when we see power laws like this, what they typically tell us is that there's some common constraint um, that's organizing behavior at all of these different scales. So if I zoom in on a scale, um, I can't tell it apart other than um, the units and how large it is relative to something else. In terms of the behavior, I can't um, tell it apart from other scales. There's some common organizing principle. Um, gravitation would be an example of a, a power law um, in more standard physics. And so when we see these power laws in biology, what they're really saying is that at the, the largest scale of evolution, there actually is some common set of constraints that seems to be um, guiding the evolutionary process. However, what you might complain about is the scatter, and rightly so. so if we zoom in at a single scale, 
you might say, well, the scatter around this central trend is many orders of magnitude. It could be three to five orders of magnitude. And if I'm a biologist interested in a single species or making predictions for a very specific environment, I might be many orders of magnitude away from the central trend. And so what good does the central trend um, do for me as someone who cares about detailed biology? From a more astrobiological perspective, you could also say, well, if I really care about the boundaries of life or the boundaries of habitability, this scatter could be where most of the interesting behavior actually is. Right? I might actually care about what is the boundary line around the central trend more than I actually care about the central trend itself. And so um, what I'll describe today are ways that we can start to add to what I would call a first order theory of the central trend, higher orders that allow us to start to understand the scatter and what's driving the scatter. And what I'll show is that the two things that could be driving the scatter um, are both ecological and evolutionary. And what I mean by ecological is that some of these points could be slightly off the central trend simply because they're living in some exotic environment or that environment is dictating certain physiological features of, of the species of interest. Um, or it could be that this scatter is uh, driven more by evolution and that these are very different species that have had very different evolutionary histories and are adapted to very different types of conditions and functions. Yeah? So this would be, um, for example, when you're uh, growing up to your adult mass, how many grams of mass are you adding um, per you per year? Something like that. So it's just how much mass you're actually contributing. Yeah. And so in, in thinking about these two possibilities, ecological or evolutionary, I'll use two different case studies. Um, we'll start with the evolutionary perspective, where I'll focus in on microbial life. Um, to talk about some of the differences and how we can start to understand taxonomic differences. Um, and for the ecological perspective, we'll focus on vascular plants um, and think a little bit about global ecology um, for forests and how this is a really nice model system to understand how environments um, can specifically modify uh, what's happening for a single organism's physiology. Beginning with this evolutionary case for microbes, um, I want to focus you on the small end of this plot where we're looking at the simplest and smallest life. And if we zoom in there, the story's a little bit more complicated than what I've been telling you thus far. So this now is metabolic rate uh, against body mass. This would be connected in some way to biomass production rate. Um, but what we now see is that as we go from bacteria to unicellular eukaryotes to small multicellular life, we now start to see distinct shifts um, in these scaling relationships. So in bacteria, we have something that scales roughly with a power of two, so this is super linear scaling. So this says that not only is metabolism not proportional to body size, um, it's proportional to the square of body size, so metabolism is increasing very fast as bacteria get bigger. If we focus on unicellular eukaryotes, we see then that their metabolism is going roughly linear or proportional to the overall body mass. And then in small multicellular life, we now see, I mean, so, yeah, small multicellular life, we now see this sublinear scaling, which actually goes all the way out um, along that plot I showed on the previous slide to things like large vascular plants and blue whales. So what this is saying is that at each of these major evolutionary transitions, where it went from very simple life to things that started to have mitochondria to things that then started to aggregate cells with mitochondria into a larger community, we see these distinct shifts in the scaling relationships. And this really tells us that there are distinct um, shifts in what the underlying constraints or common limitations um, are for all these different classes of organisms. And this might tell us something really interesting about evolution and also about the limitations faced. For example, why didn't bacteria just simply continue to grow much larger? Um, and why aren't we made of uh, multicellular prokaryotes rather than um, why aren't we multicellular prokaryotes rather than multicellular um, eukaryotes? And so in order, in order to understand these limitations a little bit better, what they imply and also what might be driving them, we need to start to connect these to more detailed physiology because this is a pretty macroscopic property of overall metabolism. And so what we'll do um, over the course of the next few slides is start to drill down into more detailed physiology for these organisms. And to do that, I want to 
introduce um, a very common relationship in biology. This is actually one of the most well reproduced um, laws or relationships in all of biology. Um, and I think it's underappreciated, but what, it, what it's called is a PERT plot. And what it relates is the growth rate of an organism, which in a steady state environment would just be um, the washout rate of that organism against what its specific resource utilization rate is. And what I mean by specific is just uh, how much of a particular resource is it using per gram of mass. And so what you see is that as an organism grows faster, you have this linear relationship connecting growth rate um, to this dilution, I mean to this specific resource consumption rate. And we can write that down then as a relationship where you have growth as a linear term divided by yield coefficient. This is just how many grams of organism do you get per gram of resource used, um, plus a maintenance um, constant. And what this maintenance constant um, is based on is recognizing that at zero growth, there's an inferred resource use um, required to, to just keep the organism alive. So it says that you, when you go to zero growth, you aren't using zero resources. There's some basal requirement of the organism just to repair um, its ongoing functions and to keep the organism from actually dying. And so if we write this in a slightly different way, um, we can connect it to metabolism directly. So if we say metabolism equals a growth term plus a maintenance term, where growth we say is just the energy to produce uh, or to synthesize a unit of biomass times how fast you're actually synthesizing biomass, plus a maintenance term, which is just how much energy it takes to um, keep a unit of mass alive times how much mass um, you actually have gives us this really nice form for metabolic rate. And if we remember that the left-hand side of this should be a general power law for different classes of organisms, we can equate these two where we now have a power law equals this growth plus maintenance term. And now we can solve for dmdt as a function of mass. If we solve that differential equation, we now have this closed form for the mass of an organism as a function of time. Now, this is admittedly complex, and I don't want you to think too much about um, the overall form of, of the equation. Um, but what is nice is that it's dependent on a small number of parameters. So it's dependent on this metabolic scaling exponent, which is just how fast metabolism grows um, as a function of how uh, fast the organism is increasing in mass. Um, and then this ratio, B, of the, of the different types of unit cost. So this is how much uh, your unit maintenance cost, how large your unit maintenance cost is relative to your unit biosynthesis cost. So this is sort of weighing um, the two types of costs that organisms feel. And then this final parameter, which is just how much energy when you're born, or in the case of a single cell, when it divides, how much energy is it actually devoting to biosynthesis um, at the start of growth. And so we've been able to show that this equation is um, incredibly flexible and fitting a wide range of single organism growth trajectories. So here's cell size against time for things like uh, E. coli, which is a bacteria, a unicellular eukaryote, and a small multicellular organism. And what's nice is that in each of these cases, we often have the energetic constants, the parameters of, of the equation I showed on the last slide, explicitly measured, and we can make predictions for what these single cell growth trajectories actually look like. More interesting than this, though, is our ability to understand across species, across ranges in body size, what should be the overall trends in something like the growth rate of a population as a function of how big the individuals in that population actually are. And so what you see is that growth, specific growth rate, which is growth rate per individual, um, is increasing for bacteria, and then it's decreasing for unicellular eukaryotes. Um, we're at this point where it, it really shifts. The colored curves are um, our um, predictions for what this trend should look like from our model. Um, the points are data, and the black lines are best power law fits. And so you can see that our model approximates a power law over some range of body sizes, and yet it also has uh, more complicated features where at distinct masses, we start to see these, this asymptotic behavior. So this asymptote happens at the large end of eukaryotes and at the small end of bacteria, and both are actually for the same reason. This is the point at which the maintenance metabolism becomes the entire metabolism. So it says the cell must spend all of its resources simply to maintain existing function, 
um, and it can't actually dedicate anything to growing or replicating. And so this is catastrophic for the cell. And what it says is that there, we should be able to predict a lower bound on bacterial size, and we should be able to predict an upper bound on eukaryotic size. So this upper bound on eukaryote size, um, I'd like to just point out, um, occurs at the place where you stop seeing um, small unicellular eukaryotes and you start seeing the appearance of small multicellular organisms. So this seems to um, anticipate this evolutionary transition from um, single cell life to multicellular life. And at the small end, um, we then have a prediction for um, the smallest possible bacterium, where in grams, this is what our prediction would be, um, and here's the range of masses for mycoplasma, um, which for a while was thought to be um, the smallest uh, freely culturable, as in it can be cultured by itself, um, organism, um, and you can see that they agree very well. Something I want to note is that this prediction is really based on average trends and behavior. So it's, it's taking the average energetics for, from this entire class of organism, and each of those average energetics, each decision of how to pick those average energetics would predict a lower bound on bacterial size. And so it's amazing then that the average behavior is able to extrapolate down to the scale at which we see the smallest bacteria. Really exciting. Um, recently, out of uh, Jillian Banfield's lab, there have been these really nice measurements of very small environmental bacteria. So mycoplasma is a mammalian parasite, whereas these um, bacteria that they're describing in this study are actually uh, captured from groundwater. So it's really neat to see these very small organisms here. And this came out after we made our prediction for the, the smallest possible bacterium. And so then the question is, how does it compare? Here's a nice um, uh, discussion of what the overall cell volume is, some properties about it, um, how much cytoplasm it has, how many ribosomes. And we can compare that, converting now to volume units from mass, I'm sorry for the unit conversion. Um, we can understand what the smallest possible organism is um, from our study as compared with the range that they're seeing um, in this study, where you see that their upper bound agrees with the smallest possible bacterium um, that we're predicting. And so these are smaller. And that's really interesting because, again, as I said in the previous slide, what we're, what we're predicting is how the average behavior would anticipate the smallest possible bacterium. And now we have organisms that are smaller than that. And so the question is, what are they doing differently to escape these, um, these average um, energetics? Right? So what, how do their energetics um, or their genetics differ in such a way that they're able to escape this, um, this average expectation for the lowest size? At the same time, uh, these average trends are really good for predicting order of magnitude, um, and we do a good job of that where um, we're seeing something that's only about a factor of three smaller than what we'd anticipate. So everything I've discussed so far um, has been about energetics. So these are um, body size against metabolic rate. We ask how do these power laws um, lead to a model where we can then explicitly derive what the specific growth rate of an organism is, along with these asymptotic behavior. This is a really nice energetic um, prediction that gets us at um, two different asymptotes where major evolutionary transitions occur. This can be thought of as a major evolutionary transition in the sense that if you're smaller than this, you're most likely a virus. Um, and that means that you're, you're not the standard bacterial self-replicating life um, that we typically think of. Um, and then here, this evolutionary transition is about um, becoming multicellular. So then you might ask, what's happening at this zone? What's happening? What motivated this transition from bacteria to eukaryotes? Why um, do we see that transition? Everything's getting better for bacteria. They're growing more and more quickly. They should be out competing organisms of the same size. And yet we don't see them larger um, than a certain scale. And very recent work that we've done has been to connect um, a more, even more detailed perspective of physiology where we actually start to think about all the processes that must go on inside a cell to, to meet these metabolic demands. Um, and in doing that, what we start to understand about this limitation um, is that at some point you start to ask certain rates to turn over too quickly. And that uh, actually gives you an upper bound on bacteria takes a while to get there, so I'll, I'll simply say that today. 
Um, but the nice thing is that this physiological limit also leads to um, a, a second prediction for the lower bound um, that's more based on space constraints, how much space does it actually take to fit in all of this physiology. Um, and this connects really well to work that was done um, out of a National Research Council um, working group that, that put out a monograph uh, many years ago sort of describing what their expectation for the smallest possible life would be in terms of volume. And you can see that the space limitations that come out of this physiological, our physiological perspective, which can both um, now anticipate the upper bound on bacteria and the lower bound, um, agrees well with um, the types of values they got at this study. And then these also compare well to our energetic prediction and explicit measurements for the range of the smallest bacteria seen in, in particular species. So I think what we're starting to develop here um, is a, a really a multi-component way of, of thinking about evolutionary transitions and the limits of small life, uh, where it looks like it's, it's based on a variety of coincidental limitations, both energetic um, and explicitly physio physiological. Um, and a lot, it seems like a lot of the things that have happened in evolution um, weren't just random, but happened at these cusps where, um, if, it, where you need a certain transition to actually get larger, right? So you can't necessarily predict that bacteria have to become eukaryotes or that eukaryotes have to arise at all in the history of life. But what you can say is that at the upper bound of bacteria, life is starting to get very challenging given how fast the rates are turning over. And that actually demands or requires something different to happen if you are to see life um, larger than that scale. So returning to this plot, um, I want to say that what we've looked at so far is how these taxonomic differences between organisms imply really radical things for uh, their physiology and also where specific limitations happen. So in bacteria, for example, because of this, the taxonomic group they fall in and what the metabolic scaling looks like in that class of organisms, uh, we expect to get a lower bound, whereas in unicellular eukaryotes, we expect to see um, an upper bound. And so with the, the physiological work I, I just described, we're beginning to understand how this can actually lead to species trade-offs. Um, and this is really exciting for starting to systematize um, some of the physical implications for evolution. Backing up, though, um, something that we constantly need to think about in all these systems is how is an organism interacting with its environment? How is the environment setting specific constraints um, on what an organism can actually do and how it can function? And to think about that, um, a little bit more, I'm going to focus in on this case study of vascular plants and vascular plant structure where I'll show that we're able to make some predictions about um, what's happening with this scatter around the central trend. So for vascular plants, um, if we really squint our eyes and, and look at them, what they look like are approximate fractal architectures, right? So it's some organism that is trying to fill space in order to gather um, sunlight and uh, to do so in the most effective way, while also taking resources from the roots and distributing them to all these um, photosynthetic areas at, at the leaf tips. And so from a physical perspective, the way that we can define this is to think about um, how this fractal architecture fills space and how the geometry and mechanics change over each generation of this fractal. So what we typically write down then is how the trunk relates to the next set of branches and how those branches relate to the, the, the generation after that. And in each case, we're concerned with how the overall bundle of vessel tubes, um, the overall branch, is changing um, in terms of its diameter because this has implications for um, mechanical stability. And then we're interested in how each vessel inside one of these tubes is tapering over the length um, going from roots to leaves. Um, because how the vessel size changes from one generation of the fractal to the next generation of the fractal actually dictates what the hydrodynamic resistance is and tells you how easy it is to move water from the trunk um, to the leaves. And then the last thing we're concerned about is how well um, this system fills space. Right? So if I had all of these, if this angle in this uh, branching was very small, then I have all the leaves in one place, and that's not very effective for, for gathering sunlight. And so if you put these constraints together, space filling, um, hydrodynamic, and mechanical, then you can start to optimize um, what the structure should look like 
um, according to each of those constraints. And so when you do that, you can make a wide variety of predictions, as people have done a lot of in past work, where um, this fractal architecture does things like anticipate how the total fluid flow through the system should be proportional to the stem diameter. Um, this actually turns out to be a, a fairly unsurprising result, where it's just a power of two, which is just basically the, you know, the total um, cross-sectional area of the trunk is determined how much water flows through it. Um, but it's interesting that that comes out of a model that's actually explicitly considering the ratio of, um, of vasculature to uh, mechanical um, wood um, in each of these generations. So this is nice, and, and actually there's a wide variety of power laws that come out of a fractal structure like this that I won't show, but the question becomes, um, how do we link it to the environment? And some, some derivations that we've done have been able to show that if you look at, say, total canopy albedo, so this is just the reflectivity or absorptivity um, of the canopy system as a function of tree height, we can predict this specific relationship for how the tree is becoming more and more absorptive to solar radiation as the tree gets larger. And then these red points are measurements um, taken from a helicopter. And so this gives us a really nice um, confidence in our models or this fractal geometry's ability to interpret the very specific uh, radiative properties of the canopy. And once we have that, we can then start to link this canopy structure to the environment explicitly. So we can ask how much sunlight um, does it absorb? Um, how much water does it gather from a similar consideration of a fractal root system? And uh, then how much water does it evaporate to the atmosphere? What's the overall energy budget of this canopy system? What's the overall water budget of the entire tree? Where in all cases, we only need a single parameter to tell us all these different features. Because we know what the optimal structure is. If you tell me the size of the tree, I can tell you on average uh, what, the, what the radiative budget is in a particular environment and what the water gathering capabilities are in a given environment from uh, the root system. Making that a little bit more explicit, um, we can write down an energy budget from the canopy, which is based on evaporative um, and other types of heat flux, such as um, conductive heat flux, where in each of these heat fluxes, the thing that's changing with size is the effective area of exchange with the atmosphere. And each of these then is a scaled property of how large the overall tree is. Um, so we have this nice size-based energy budget, and then we can do the same thing uh, for the water budget um, where we can understand how the, the roots of a given size of tree plus incoming precipitation actually lead to an available water supply um, for, for a given organism, for a given tree. Uh, we need a way to compare all of these different types of budgets. And what's really nice is that the actual flow of water becomes a, a very good common currency where this energy budget is closed by the evaporative flux to the atmosphere. And then that, at some level, should balance out the water budget for the roots. Making that explicit, we can define a tree of a given size and then think about different types of water flow, where the first is how much water do you need to flow just to meet basal requirements? So just to keep all the tissues and leaves al alive, what's the flow rate that supports that metabolism? This gives us a scaling for a minimal water flux that's actually needed. We then can ask, what's the available water flow from the root system given an incoming precipitation and how large the tree is? So this curve's intercept is set by incoming precipitation, um, but its overall scaling is the same in different environments. And now these define a relationship for successful tree existence, where anywhere in this regime, um, we would say it's habitable for trees. So it's meeting its basal requirements without exceeding the available amount of water it's able to get from the soil. Outside of this, we start to run into um, different types of limitations where we can interpret what those limitations actually mean. So here's an energy limited regime. It's pumping less water than it needs to to support metabolism. Here's a water limited regime. It's trying to pump more water than it can actually gain. Um, and then some limitation where actually both matter. So then what, the way that the, the rest of the environment affects this curve is via the evaporative flow. So given atmospheric conditions, um, humidity, temperature, um, pressure, et cetera, we can then, for one of these canopies, knowing the incoming solar flux, predict what this evaporative curve looks like 
um, as a function of tree height. And what we now see is that this curve in a single environment will intersect one of these two curves at some size. And that size is the tallest possible um, tree that you, can, that you can actually get in that environment. Right? So here, if the tree were to grow larger, it enters this water-limited regime. And so this is the maximum possible size um, in a given environment. So we can then take meteorological inputs for, say, the continental United States, where we also have very good ground measurements for tree size. And we can solve in each of these environments. We have a whole family of, of these evaporative curves, these black evaporative curves, um, for every single point in the US. And then we can make a prediction for what maximum tree height across the, the US actually looks like and compare that with observations for tree height. Um, this then is the relative error between observations and predictions. And you see that we do a good job on average of, of actually capturing um, what maximum tree height is. Now, something I should say is that um, this is sort of amazing to me in some sense because we're using average plant traits. We're using this um, generalized average plant architecture. And we're putting all these things together in a way um, where we predict uh, maximum size. Um, and so it's, it's impressive then that it does so well across diverse environments. And in fact, in environments where it doesn't do well, we can often understand why. So in, say, the Rocky Mountain uh, region of uh, the US, we see that we systematically um, underpredict uh, tree heights. And the reason for that is that this is an area where there's lots of drought adapted species, there's very specific adaptations, and there's also very complicated hydrology. So if you if you go out into these regions, what you typically see is the largest trees are in gullies or um, have some sort of shading or in the bottom of a big ravine. And so the meteorology or the hydrology that a single tree is experiencing is often very different from um, what the weather station is reporting. And then other places that the model does less well um, is here in the Northeast where we systematically over predict tree height. Um, and we actually think this is due to uh, many recent disturbance events and the time scale required for trees to grow back up to this maximum size. And some work that a, a graduate student, um, Sung Ho Choi at BU has done with me, has actually been to show that if you look in these forests, they, are, um, they haven't fully equilibrated to the maximum size. And it seems that they're headed towards what we would predict as the maximum in each, in each of these environments. So then what we can do is say, in each environment, we predict a maximum size. We ask how recently the forest was disturbed. And then we can back out where in this trajectory that forest is and make a new prediction for tree height. And that actually removes, um, it, it, it reduces the error and removes any sort of modality um, based on these differences from uh, disturbance events. And so um, that's all really nice. But something that I, I promised at the beginning of, of starting this part of the talk is that I could understand something about the scatter in these plots, and I could tell you something about species level differences in addition to environmental level differences. And so can we say anything about speciation, adaptation, um, environmental trade-offs? And the answer is yes. And what we do is recognize that this point is a very special point in this plot, because it tells you what the, the maximum possible tree is, given basal requirements and incoming precipitation. So these evaporative curves are adjusted by shifts in the canopy geometry or the number of leaves or any number of features about the tree. And if so, if they vary from this average architecture that we're describing, you might actually be able to hit this upper bound um, in a way uh, that maximizes tree size. So if we take one um, common plant trait, the number of pores on a leaf, density of pores on a leaf, in each of these environments, we could say, what would that density be so that this evaporative curve goes directly through this upper bound? And then that gives us a prediction for how this stomatal density, pore density, should change as a function of mean annual temperature um, compared to observations. And we, so we see this average trend um, of decreasing pore density with increasing mean annual temperature. And this is one way to get at adaptation. Of course, there's a lot of scatter here, and that scatter mostly owes to the fact that um, these environments that have the same temperature might have radically different sets of other meteorological parameters. So the relative humidity could be very different in these environments, um, as could um, the amount of mean annual precipitation. But this does give us an avenue then to start understanding how plant traits vary um, and how we might consider a wide range of traits and constraints um, optimized to each environment. <coughs> 
uh, beyond that, we can also then take a single uh, environment where we have a predicted maximum size and we have one of these evaporative curves and ask how that would respond to um, differences in, in, say, precipitation or precipitation and temperature, and we can predict tree height as a function of any precipitation or temperature in a given environment, and this allows us to do things like anticipate how much tree heights would change in response to changing climate, say a plus two or minus two degree uh, difference in mean annual temperature, where you can see that tree heights are expected to change by about um, 10 or 11 percent across the continental United States. Um, and you might ask, who cares? These are, you know, it's nice to know how tall our trees are going to be, um, but why do we care so much about tree height? And recent work that we've been able to do is show that you can take these environmental conditions, predict maximum tree height, and then that maximum tree height actually is a really good indicator for the overall forest structure um, and over, uh, overall um, uh, conditions and properties of the entire forest. And so this allows us then to do things like predict whole forest um, evaporation rates or um, carbon uptake rates um, simply by knowing what this maximum tree size is. And so that's, again, a really powerful way to make a variety of predictions using only a single um, parameter input. And be, again, because this model is so simple in terms of depending on this generalized fractal architecture, depending on only a few um, environmental conditions, um, and then being able to predict uh, regional whole forest properties from just this maximum size, this allows us to do things like um, start dropping this into climate models, um, say a very simplified planet, say these aqua planets out of John Marshall's group at MIT, um, where we can ask very simple questions about what the feedback of vegetation actually is on the overall climate system um, in terms of, say, going to runaway snowballs um, or preventing those events. And beyond that, we could also uh, easily take this model um, and put it into a variety of planetary systems and ask what are the signals that vegetation would give you and what would those planetary scale um, responses actually be? Where again, the only thing that you really need to think about is has evolution had a long enough period of time to actually optimize these plant structures? What are the dominant physics that lead to optimal plant structure? Um, and how does that vary at a, for a given planet? Um, so you can, re, you can relax the mechanical constraints in different sorts of uh, gravitation and solve for optimal fractal geometries and all of those. And this gives you a really nice way to understand um, what's happening at a planetary scale um, given the possibility for vegetation and presuming that it's had a long enough time to reach um, these evolutionary optima. Um, and so what I've hoped I've been able to show today is that these general trends have um, a lot of power in giving you a wide variety of, of predictive capabilities, but also allow us to think fairly abstractly about um, life, evolution, and how they relate to dominant physical constraints, where we might be able to predict um, ecological response in a, in a variety of worlds, um, or understand what it is that really are the dominant constraints uh, motivating uh, major evolutionary um, transitions. And so with that, I would, I'd like to just summarize um, and, and, and sort of recount what we've done, um, which is to say that these scaling perspectives, I think, um, again, do a really nice job of generalizing physiology in a way that we can interpret and predict dominant constraints and environments in order to understand things like evolutionary transitions. Um, and where we can also simply connect uh, these scaling relationships to environmental constraints um, in a way that we can um, predict the range of habitability and also the response to um, shifts in environment for um, vegetation um, and or uh, microbial life. So with that, I'd like to thank a, a wide range of really great collaborators um, spanning many institutions and uh, many different stages of the last uh, five or six years. Um, and I'd, I'd be very happy to take any questions if anyone uh, has any. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, before we go to questions, I would like to uh, present uh, Chris with the SETI Talk mug as a token of our thanks for being here today and as a re reminder of your time with us. Thank you very much, yeah, great. <laughs>
And uh, to ask the first question, I, uh, I, I think you touched on this a bit at the end of your talk, but I'm uh, interested in uh, maybe a little bit more of how this work could be expanded into thinking in terms of timescales. Um, you know, evolution, you could probably characterize it as taking a particular response time. If a particular niche opens up, you could look into uh, paleo temperature data and, and, and so forth to, to uh, model when a particular niche opens up. And then by observing what organisms are actually there, can you say something about what's the response time for evolution to respond to the opening up of a, of a particular niche? Yeah. Um, so that's a great question. And I think um, there's kind of an easy answer and a hard answer. <laughs> uh, so the easy answer is if you know a lot about a particular physiology, then it's very easy to start uh, making modifications to that in the environment and asking how quickly can something like this evolve to that, knowing something about mutation rates um, or genetics. Um, so that, that part's fairly easy for small shifts for very well-characterized organisms. I think the harder thing um, is in thinking about these really long-term evolutionary uh, types of processes where you could ask, well, how long does it take you to go from bacteria to unicellular eukaryotes? Um, and so I'd, I'd say from our work, we can say we know at what scale that transition should occur. We know at what size. Um, but the time scale actually required um, is still something that's very hard to define because it may just be that we know you can't get bigger than this, um, but the particular solution might actually be a very diverse space of possibilities, and then the waiting time for each of those solutions may have a large amount of variance, right? So if you're waiting for some endosymbiotic event to engulf another bacterium and eventually for those to find an evolutionary tra trajectory towards a mitochondria inside a eukaryotic cell, that might be a very rare event with a very rare trajectory, um, evolutionary trajectory. And so the, the, the range of possibilities for that waiting time might actually be very large. And so knowing that you get eukaryotes or that you need to get eukaryotes to get bigger is a prediction we can make. Uh, asking how long it actually takes for that rare event to occur, um, I think is something that um, is still very tricky. And we need to know something about the basic process, say, true endosymbiotic events, what's the actual rate of those occurring, um, to say something about the waiting time. So yeah. Thank you. This was a, a fascinating talk. And I could ask a bunch of different questions, but I'll stick to one. Um, at, at the end, you touched on this. Because we're at the SETI talk series, I'm going to ask you, uh, can, how would generalizing plant, plant size and growth to other planets be if you have the different variables of uh, gravity of the planet and the solar output from uh, the local star? How would that change, like if it, your expectations? Do you, did you do any of that uh, yeah. just playing around? Um, so we've done some of that. We haven't, we haven't fully formalized it, but we've thought about it generally. And so one of the things you'd expect is if you lower gravitation, you're then uh, greatly reducing uh, the mechanical constraints and um, also the hydrodynamic constraints, because those are all gravity driven. So you'd expect to see for, say, the same trunk diameter, uh, vastly different, uh, say, canopy radiuses or radii, <laughs> um, because you'd allow trees to get bigger for, say, the same branch, which has some fixed mechanical property, you'd imagine the canopy could be much wider and still not buckle. It could also be much taller before reaching the, the hydrodynamic limits that we know the tallest trees on Earth face. It could be taller and wider, yeah, for low gravity. And so then the question becomes, um, in terms of light, uh, how much space filling you need to do with that. So the, the two things are how many leaves do you actually need to put in space? Are you, is solar radiation so high that you're content with a few sparse leaves and gravity is really low, so you just have a few leaves on these very long sticks? Um, or is solar radiation also really low in the case where you need to pack in more leaves to meet basal metabolic requirements? And so I think those are the, the tr that's the trade-off space that you'd play with. Um, and at some level, that, that must boil down to the leaf physiology and just asking, well, what's the minimal solar flux per unit cell um, to actually keep the tree alive? Um, and that's something that you could start with as a basis and then ask, well, what sort of space filling can you do under the given mechanics of, of a planet? Yeah. Thank you. So one of your last slides, you seem to be making a prediction of a temperature change reflected into the maximum height a tree could attain. And so getting back here to what's happening on Earth, 
if we have, um, say, a two degrees rise in temperature, does that mean trees that are above a certain height are probably going to die because they're just too big? It does, yeah. So, so part of the way we think about this model is uh, for a given point in time, say a given year, that gives you one maximum tree height. But what we really care is the long-term average and what those dynamics look like and how often the limits are dipping below a tree of a given height. And then you ask how much tolerance, how much capacity does a tree have to soak up a drought for a couple years, say given internal fluid storage. And so yeah, it, it does say that if you have a long-term environment, say in complete steady state, and you get trees of a certain maximum and then the temperature warms and that maximum tree height goes down, after some waiting time, all the trees larger than that should die. Um, so that is the prediction. And it's, um, it's a scary one if you really care about tall trees and you have some aesthetic sense of that. Um, also, though, I would say that each of these tree heights is telling us something about um, the overall forest density um, because it's really a metabolism per unit area. So it's telling us how dense the forest can be um, and how many trees there can be and what the biomass density is. And so all those things are also going down. Um, and so this really says that um, you know, I haven't converted in this plot to change in, say, uh, carbon uptake rates or biomass density, um, but it's pretty bad for, you know, a 10% change in maximum tree height. Thank you. It's a very interesting talk, and I wondered, uh, obviously, this would allow you to calculate what might happen in the future, but of course, one might ought to check it by seeing what happened in the past. Mm. You have a huge variety of trees of different heights. You also have the fact that since the last ice age, there's been quite a variety in temperature. Do you find for the variety of trees that you can check uh, and the temperature changes that have occurred, you have some model agreement? Um, so we haven't checked that yet. There's really, you're right, there is really interesting paleo data um, where people have used these allometric relationships to try and say, if you see a fossil trunk of some size, what was the climate actually like? Um, and that's a place where if you had enough different um, climactic variables measured in an independent record that you actually could check the agreement um, with maximum size. And then you're also right over just human measurements. You know, human, uh, for, our, for our current records, there are places where we could look at major shifts in climate and, and which trees died. Um, that, that's something we're, uh, that's on our list and, and we haven't gotten to it yet. The, the thing we really need is, is very detailed plots where you knew what trees were there and then which of them died. So I'm, I'm, we're positive that exists, we just haven't um, gotten around to doing it yet. So, yeah, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, anyone in your group is looking at uh, a kind of corresponding fractal model of uh, multicellular animals and how big they can get. Yeah, so um, there has been a lot of scaling work done in uh, vascular mammals. Um, they sent, tend to follow the same trends. Um, and there, a lot of the work that's been done is thinking about the same hydrodynamic limitations, but um, thinking about that under a pulsatile system, where you have this heart that's sending out these pulsatile waves, and whether those waves can um, make it to the end of the capillaries, basically, and, and supply oxygen there. Um, and so that does lead to some constraints. Um, we haven't done the thing yet where we explicitly connect those environments, those animals to their environments. Um, it's trickier for animals, animals because they do um, a better job of homeostasis, right? They regulate their own temperature in some sense. They're mobile so they can, um, you know, their foraging patterns actually matter a lot for how good their resource flux is. Um, and so those are things we're thinking about, but uh, you know, plants are actually much easier than animal, animals for, for a variety of, variety of those reasons, yeah. Thanks. I was wondering how you uh, fit in uh, our coastal redwoods here in California. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the characteristics, I believe, uh, that distinguishes them from some of the other trees, aside from their age and height, is that they obtain water not just from, from the ground, but also from the fog, from, from the atmosphere. Yep. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I, you know, I think the, the coastal redwoods have a variety of, of really nice species adaptations that allow them to get so tall. Um, there is a lot of discussion about how much of the fluid they're actually getting is coming from fog rain, which is just uh, water that condenses on leaves and falls to the ground and is, is counted in the, the soil budget versus uh, you know, some seeping in from the, in, into the leaves. Um, but if, if we look at those environments in our model, what we do see 
is um, that these redwoods are in these really um, ideal environments where uh, the humidity is moderate, the temperature isn't too hot, um, you have a good amount of precipitation, you still have lots of energy from good sunlight, you know, the fog rolls in the morning, drops some precipitation, it gets sunny in the afternoon, but not being too hot. And so they really do sit at this, this real sweet spot for getting large trees. Um, and it's, it's a really, you know, we've looked at that environment and said, oh, this is, you know, this is the environment that really give us very tall trees. And we see that all along the, um, the western coast of the U.S., that it's good environments for tall trees. Uh, I had, uh, uh, quite, I'd like a clarification and then, and then a question. Uh, and I, I wondered if you'd mind putting the slide back up that showed the transition from uh, from the prokaryote to the eukaryote to the multicellular. Yeah, tell me if that's large enough or if I should find uh, a different No, one. that's, that's yeah. fine. Uh, I'd like to be more clear with regard to what's being plotted there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a specific growth rate and, and body mass. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you're talking in the case of, of prokaryotes of the entire biomass of a culture with several cells? Yeah, sorry. So this is... Um, body mass of a single organism plotted against the specific growth rate of that culture, which is really an organism level measurement. So what it says is, um, if I wrote down the growth rate of the whole population, dn, dt, it would equal specific growth rate times how many individuals I have. And so it's really the growth, how fast a single individual is moving towards replication is the way to think about it. So this is then individual size against um, some metric of the inverse of uh, the generation time of that organism. So just how fast it takes one individual to go through its life cycle. And the two transitions that you're spotting on that from prokaryote to, to unicellular eukaryote and then to the multicellular eukaryote, uh, those, those two transitions then are being limited because uh, are being determined by, uh, by maintenance requirements being too great for there to be much further growth. Exactly, yeah. Uh, now, uh, what's, what's being maintained? The entire biomass of a yeah. group of individuals? So this would be for a single individual, how much energy does it take to maintain its existing mass? And, and it should be noted um, that 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 constant, the per unit mass uh, maintenance, is something that is pretty, is not well understood um, even given 40 or 50 years of thinking about it. Um, so what metabolic processes go into repair and maintenance, um, how low you can actually push that value, that constant are all things that we think a lot about and that the community as a whole thinks a lot about. Um, and it's, but, but basically what it's coming down to is things like membrane repair, um, repairing proteins that have been broken that you need for your metabolism, so you have to repair them or resynthesize them. Um, keeping the proton motive force active. These are all the sorts of processes you think about going into maintenance. Um, how much of that is coupled to growth rate is, is a complication, um, but we do have some f at least phenomenological measurements for what that constant actually is. And so it's just a, um, so what, what's happening with these trade-offs then is that, say, metabolism in this organism is going up linearly, but at the same time, the percentage of that metabolism devoted to maintenance is outpacing that, and there comes a point where the, the total metabolism equals just the mass times that unit maintenance cost, um, which again is a bundle of a bunch of processes that we don't um, fully understand yet as a community. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, no, that, and how low that maintenance value can go is a, you know, a very hot topic, and uh, lots of really good people are working on it, but it's, it's tricky because there's so many, you know, involves burrowing into the entire physiology and thinking about these trade-offs and processes. If I could ask a slightly mathematical question about yeah. your differential equation for body mass that you were just discussing. Um, it seemed to me that you're making the assumption that all of the body mass, all of the biomass that's produced remains part of the organism. Um, there are, in fact, various forms of waste or other processes by which biomass is produced that does not remain part of the organism, which seems like it ought to be incorporated into your M dot term, but not in your M term. Is that something that you would argue is negligible, or is that something that can be absorbed into your use of constants, or how do you deal with that? Yeah, so it, it can be absorbed in the use of constants. Okay. So, so even total metabolism would, in, would have some waste in it, and so there's, 
there are some constants floating around there that, we, that we're not making explicit. And so if you, if you cared about fundamentally and from first principles calculating the constants, that's something you'd need to be very careful about. So yeah, thanks for clarifying that, yeah. So the, just looking at that, that plot again, uh, the uh, prokaryotes, as they get bigger, mm -hmm. um, grow faster. The eukaryotes, as they get bigger, grow slower. Yep. Um, simple explanation possible? Yeah, so in, our, in, the, in the model that we derive, um, if the metabolic scaling exponent is greater than one, you grow faster as you get bigger, and if the metabolic scaling exponent is less than one, or approximately one, uh, you grow slower as you get bigger. So it's just how, um, take me too many slides to go back, it's just how that uh, alpha enters into these. So they're, that in both of these cases is coming from the power law for body mass against metabolic rate, where prokaryotes has an exponent of two and eukaryotes is linear or slightly sublinear. Yeah, so that's, that, that's where it comes from and it, you know, the, yeah. <laughs> so thanks. So they're still growing, but they're growing slower. They're growing, but they're growing slower. And as, and there are, of course, rates in here where the bacteria and the eukaryotes would have the same growth rate for very different body masses. It's just as you pass those body masses, which direction are you headed? Yeah. So could you comment briefly on symbiosis? What happens when other kinds of organisms are uh, in the same environment or interacting with these kind of individual organisms? You're talking yeah. about, uh, I guess, it's like talking about the difference between the wild and cultivated or something like yeah. this. No, you're hitting on a really important issue there, which is um, these curves are all maximum growth rates for one organism living in isolation in conditions it really likes. And so what we're really saying is that at each of these different sizes, looking at a range of species, how fast can you actually grow? But the range of growth rates for one organism is pretty vast. Um, and so if you think about that PERT plot I showed, you can really dial down, say, the growth of an E. coli to very small rates, and that fundamentally is about how much it's getting from the environment. So if you expand that then to think about symbiosis, uh, that's just a different sort of environmental feed. It's an environment with a, gr a larger number of feedbacks, right? So it's then not only what am I getting from the environment, but the fact that what I'm getting from the environment may depend on what I'm doing for my symbiotic partner. Um, and so it's just, it just adds a layer of, of feedbacks and dynamics and um, environmental responses uh, that's complicated. Um, a lot of the way that we would like to think about symbiosis in certain cases is as the whole bundle. Let's so say you have a bundle of, of bacteria living in a biofilm or an aggregate. Um, there you might be able to say something about, well, that bundle is responding to the external environment and that allows us to segregate the two. Um, and you could ask really interesting questions about, well, what's the difference between a collection of cells in a bundle that aren't genetically identical and a, un and a multicellular organism where there's actually regulation at the organism scale for the single cells based on a genetic program that encodes for the whole multicellular life. Um, so yeah, those are really interesting questions that we're, we're very interested in. So yeah, thanks. All right, well thank you all for a great discussion and yeah, thank, thank you, you Chris for a great talk. Let's thank Chris Kempis. Yeah, again. thanks again. Thanks again, yeah. Thanks for the questions, those are great.